here was some kind of a string quartet with a soloist, and that lady sang, the comforter has come like I've never heard before in my life. And no matter how many other times I hear it now, I always think of MacArthur Park. You'd think you would think about the comforter because a many number of people needed the comforter there, let me tell you that. <laughs> and I think some found it as well. We invite you to take your Bibles and turn to James chapter 4, if you will, please. Now, the first Sunday of the year, I said, I don't believe in making resolutions, and I don't make resolutions, and so now this is the third Sunday I'm talking about a resolution. But I'm resolved that this will be the last Sunday that I talk about a resolution. James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, and spend a year there, and engage in business, and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him, it is a sin. Now, perhaps in a more serious tone than I've taken with this notion of a resolution, it seems to me that we as Christians are indeed given to at least one resolution. And in my view, it's the only one we need to be involved with. And it has to do with the very core of our Christian faith. It has to do with our relationship with Jesus Christ. And if there is any resolution that should take place, and probably should take place daily if necessary, that we should be resolved to be more like Jesus Christ. And if we're going to be resolved like Jesus Christ, this is the core of the issue. We need to be resolved in our acceptance of the will of God. Think about it for a moment. We've met people along the way who've asked God for something and God didn't do it and they were angry at God because he didn't do it. And that teaches us that at least at that moment, at that particular point, that this person was not saying, nevertheless, let your will be mine, but may my will be yours. And that does not go well. It does not go at all with the walk of faith. And surely when we speak of faith as we see, faith comes in different categories. And a real faith, a vibrant, born-again faith, will always have this res resolution that we are resolved in our acceptance of the will of God. And in order to be resolved, I want us to look at at least three of the basic points that James sends to his readers. That as we follow the text, we first of all see that there is an assumed reality. But standing behind that assumed reality, there is a basic reality. And for some people, and for all of us, really, there is a necessary recognition. And that recognition deals with our assumed reality and that which is basically there. It seems strange to me that we should be saying this, but in the times in which we live, when we have Supreme Court justices basically saying a person needs to be free so that he can create himself. Now there's something out of nothing. And when we hear all the time, I can invent myself anew every day. Does this not sound like the claim to creative power? And there is something wrong with that particular statement. And this assumed reality can be a flight from 
real reality that is basic and fundamental. So we need to take a look at that very first step. There is the assumed reality. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Keep in mind as we enter into this text that James is not writing to a gathering of unbelievers. He is writing to a gathering of people spread here and there to be sure. But they all make Christian claims. And what we read here is something that we could do as well. Notice what is said, the assumed reality. It gets right down to the core of the human will. We will go. We will stay. We will do. We will achieve. Really. Take a look at the latest disaster on the cruise ship. We will go. We will take a trip. We will enjoy. But some will never be able to say that again. And we know that if they were in their right minds, if they knew what was going to happen, they would not get on that ship. But notice the assertion, we will go as though it were in our power. We will stay as though it were in our power. We will do as though it were in our power. And we will achieve as though it were in our power. Notice they claim to have the power. They claim to have the power to initiate the project of their choosing. They claim to have the power to choose the time, to choose the place, to choose the project, to sustain the project, to terminate the project, and to call it a success. What do they really know? All they really know are the plans that they have set in their mind. And those plans are mental facts, but they may not be facts beyond their own mentality. And so that means that we should take a look at the basic reality, the things that are always there, the things that work in our favor, the things that don't work in our favor. And notice that James gives to them a call to reality. It's a reality check. It's a time to really wake up from Dreamsville. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow, much less a year from now. You're just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Notice that they know nothing about tomorrow. What they know about tomorrow is what they plan to do. But they do not know that those plans will ever be accomplished will ever be implemented to make an attempt at achievement. You do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. And notice they don't know what awaits them for tomorrow. And that's why they cannot say what their lives will be like within a 24-hour period not to mention 365 days later. The writer of the book of Ecclesiastes states, For I have taken all this to my heart and explain it that righteous men, wise men, and their deeds are in the hand of God. Man does not know whether it will be love or hatred. Anything awaits him and he does not know what it is until he is confronted by it. But we already have the clue as to how we can have a real grip on reality. Note again and explain it that righteous men, wise men, and their deeds, notice, they are all in the hand of God. 
One of the Proverbs states that man devises his way, but God orders his steps. There's where it begins and there's where it ends. And he does not even know the time of his end. Moreover, man does not know his time. Like fish caught in a treacherous net and birds trapped in a snare, so the sons of men are snared at an evil time when it suddenly falls on them. If they know nothing of tomorrow, how can they know anything about the following days of the year? For some of you who have lived in California, you know what it's like to have your plans, and all of a sudden, an earthquake knocks down the freeway so you can't get out of the valley. Your plans change drastically. And we can think of any number of things where our plans must be put on the shelf or totally discarded because of the change of circumstances over which we have no control. And even if he knew, notice he would have no control over these overwhelming events. I again saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift and the battle is not to the warriors and neither is bread to the wise, nor wealth to the discerning, nor favor to men of ability, for time and chance overtake them all. Now remember that the writer of Ecclesiastes is looking at life from two perspectives. One perspective is under the sun. What we can see and what we can know and we don't know that God is even there. And then take a look at life knowing that God is there. And there is a great difference. So I saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, and the battle is not to the warriors, and neither is bread to the wise, nor wealth to the discerning, nor favor to men of ability. Time and chance overtake them all. And that is the only real sense of equity and equality that we have as we walk the road to the greatness of the kingdom. And notice that they are limited in power. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Many of you who grew up in the cold country, did you play with the vapors? On our way to school, we did some challenging intellectual things on cold days. We would blow our breath, and then we would have this contest to see whose breath would hang out there the longest. So some of us would try to run and put our hands under it and around it, and it disappeared, gone forever, never saw it again. So some of us tried to take a deep breath and just keep on blowing. Now, I could win that one, but still the vapor would go away. <laughs> And there's where I found that hot air has value, <laughs> but the whole category has no value. And this is the substance of our lives. We are no more than vapor. Hot air in a cold environment. And yet, there is a necessary recognition that gives value to the vapor. And that's what we want to look at. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. 
Notice that in the term the boasting and arrogance, there is this idea of pretending. Let's pretend. They only pretend when they say that they will go, stay, do, and accomplish. They have a picture of themselves that does not relate to reality at all. And this assertion is arrogant boasting. They place themselves in sovereign authority. It's as though they have control over the circumstances of tomorrow and all the days thereafter. And having control of all those circumstances in time, they have control of the outcome of their desires. They are playing God. They place themselves in sovereign authority and this boasting is evil. For God shares his glory with no one. And this boasting is evil because they deny that God is the source of their lives. In his sermon on the Acropolis, Paul said, The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. This is the point of reality that we must be sure is in our planning process. They, when they say, we will go, we will stay, we will do, we will achieve, they speak as God. God spoke, let there be light, and there was. God spoke, let there be, and it happened. Man tries to emulate that, but does not have the capability in any way. They deny that God is the source of their lives. And they further deny that God is the one who sustains their lives. For in him we live and move and exist as even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. To me, this is a critical verse that we should know. For here is the foundation of all things. Here is the foundation for all of material life and the foundation for redemptive life. And notice it is in him Sometimes we picture God as being way out there somewhere, and in terms of his sovereignty, that's not a half bad image. But when it comes to being grounded in something to have life, it is God. It is in him that we live. It is in him that we move. It is in him that we exist, where we can say, we will go here, we will go there, we will do this, we won't do that, we will accomplish. How many people in their long-range planning and strategy actually plan for failure. I've been to a few strategy sessions and that kind of thing along the way, but I don't ever remember paying good money to have some guru with a PhD tell me how I can plan for failure. I don't need that. I do that all by myself. I'm adept. And we need to know that we also are his children, all by creation, some by redemption. And notice, this is what we should say. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. Now James had a number of choices on using the term if. 
The if that he uses here is if he wills, and I don't know if he will or he won't. And as I give some thought to this verse, when we were younger, I don't know how it goes anymore, it seems like there was always some kind of a sermon or a Bible study where we could know whether or not we are in the center of God's will. As I see it, both by decree and by permission, we are always in the center of God's will. What is at issue is, do we really want to know it and live by it? And this at least begins to address that issue when James says instead, this is what you ought to say. Underscore ought. It is a moral obligation. If the Lord wills, if he says yes, we will live. And if he says yes, we will also do this or that. But if he says no, it remains nothing other than figments of our imagination. We do not know what it is that he wills until he chooses to reveal it. Just as you do not know the path of the wind and how bones are formed in the womb of the pregnant woman, so you do not know the activity of God who makes all things. And when we studied some months back now the providence of God, what we found out, he was not only the creator and the sustainer of the universe, but he is also the Lord of history. He decrees and it will be done. He permits and it will happen. And in the end, all things will redound to his honor and to his glory. And so we should keep it in mind that we do not know what it is that he wills until he chooses to reveal his will. And that teaches us that the events of our lives are not nearly as important as having a right relationship with the one who controls the events of our lives. And that is what it means to be more like Jesus. But we need to know this, that this we do know, that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. One of the theologians that brought this notion out clearly is St. Anselm. He said, God is good, and therefore, if he affects justice and somebody doesn't like it, it is still good. If he affects blessing and people don't like it, it is still good. Undoubtedly, the people who receive the blessing understand the goodness, and this is the point. Somehow, we need to develop in our walk, if we haven't already, to be able to say the same as Job, whose circumstances were far from anything I would want to be in. In a short period of time, he lost his children, he lost his fortune, and he should have lost his wife. <laughs> she comes up and says, why don't you curse God and die? Now there's a real encouraging wife. I go back to Genesis all the time, and he made her to be a help me to him, and she comes up and says, curse God and die. And what does he say? Shall I take the good from God and refuse the evil? The Lord gives and the Lord takes away, and this one thing I know, blessed be the name of the Lord. Now that has to be a statement of faith. That isn't a glib confession, don't you think? But this we have to face and happily so, that whatever is going on in our lives, and it may be dark and it may be bright, but in either case, these events are in the hand of God who causes these things to work out for good to all of those who love him and who, by the way, are called 
according to his purpose. We do not know that it is his will to do his good pleasure in us. Or we do know. And I've taken great comfort on any number of situations in my life to go back to this, to read and to remember that I am not alone. That God is in my life. And he is at work both at the point of the will and to the point of the doing of the deed for his good pleasure. And if it is for his good pleasure, then I have the reasonable assurance that the day comes when I will stand before him, I will hear, well done, you good and faithful servant. And if that is not the ultimate goal of our life, tell me one that is better because I can't think of it. We started off by saying we should be resolved. We should be resolved to be more like Christ. So at the point of Christ and him being confronted by the will of the Father, what can we glean? He taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is a good working platform. And it should fairly well be that our prayer lives and our plans should never be separated from your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And sometimes it's a stretch to see that, isn't it? But still, this is our prayer. And here is a prayer, I think, for one another. To be the agents and the instruments of God's will on earth. Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, may he equip you in every good thing so that you can do out, go out and do whatever you want. Isn't that what it says up there on the screen? <laughs> equip you in every good thing to do his will. Working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's check our prayer life as we pray for one another. That we ask the Lord to make us all the more open and amenable to doing his good will. To equip us in every good thing working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever. And that takes us to the dark night of Gethsemane. And we have the equivalent of Gethsemane in our lives from time to time. If we haven't had it yet, you're at the front of the line. Most of us here have gone to Gethsemane more than once. But hopefully there comes a time when it comes to us knowing God's will and seeing it face to face that we can still say the prayer of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and he went just a little beyond his disciples and he fell on his face and he prayed saying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. This cup that is filled with a bitter experience, let it pass from me. I don't like it. I don't want it. But notice how it ended. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And he had to get up and leave Gethsemane and drink the cup dry. 
That is the resolution, I feel, that we should be making to be more like Jesus Christ. And at the very center of being like Jesus Christ, we must be able to freely and totally say, Father, not my will, but yours be done. And that is not always easy, is it? But I think in the end, it is always a blessing. Our Father, as we come to you in prayer, forgive us for our arrogance when we say we're going to do this, that, or the other. And we do it in a way where we fail to take into account that it's in you that we live and move and have our being. We fail to take into account that we are your people and we are here to do your will. It is our prayer that you will make us ever sensitive to seeking to do your will in our lives ever and always. Knowing that to do that, we need to be more like Jesus Christ every day. May we be open. May we be willing. May your spirit work in us harshly or gently, whatever it takes to get it done. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And if you do not know what it is to be like Christ by being born again, then you can pray right where you are and ask the Lord to be your Savior, and he will do that. But if you need to know more what that means, I'll be glad to speak with you. God bless. Would you please stand as we sing hymn number 597, Take My Life and Let It Be? We're going to sing verse 1, 5, and 6.